uh, let's get into the Word. Um, this is called Real Peace in a Really Messed Up World. I have fun with my titles. Uh, <laughs> Doug kind of referenced this uh, a little bit more first service too, but how difficult it can be sometimes living in this world, the craziness of this world, right? The brokenness of this world, but Jesus is with us. He really is. I want to talk about uh, real peace, and I want to start with, uh, well, let's see, Psalm 37, 1 through 11. Uh, before I read this, I just want to tell you what I want for you here. Uh, when, I, when I come with a message, there's always something that I want for you, right? It's something that God has uh, laid on my heart. He's spoken to me. I don't, I don't make stuff up, and I don't just steal somebody else's sermon. I wait on God, and he speaks to me. But when he speaks to me, man, it's just, it, gets, it gets alive in my heart, right? And there's something that I, from that message that I really want you to have. And so it's the same way today. What I want you to have in your life, really, uh, in, especially in this messed up world, is I want you to have a supernatural peace. Now, I'm going to explain that, but I don't, want you to, I don't want this world for you to be a source of fear or distress or even anger. I want you to be powerful followers of Jesus, and I want you to have a supernatural peace and focus inside of you. And so uh, let's go after that today. I want to start uh, with talking about the, just the, the fact the Bible says that in the end, Jesus wins and we win. And that's actually a great uh, reassurance to anybody, right? If you understand it, it's a huge reassurance. Uh, God tells the end from the beginning. There's no questions about how this ends. Uh, and so in Psalm 37, 1 through 11, I think this is kind of uh, funny and cool. Uh, it says, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. That's literally God telling you, Holy Spirit telling you, there's all kinds of craziness going on in the world. There's evil in the world. There's evildoers, and it looks like they're getting away with stuff sometimes too, right? And God says, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. Don't get all upset. Uh, you know, Go on. He said, they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. They're going to be gone someday, right? They're just... And then he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Keep going. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now he says it again. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Don't let it eat your lunch. Don't, don't let it make you crazy. Don't let it you know, steal your peace. Don't let it ruin, ruin your day or your week or your month or your year. Uh, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. It's kind of, he's really kind of saying that we, when we embrace you know, the craziness that, that this world could give you, that we actually sort of become an echo chamber of it and we sort of reproduce it and we carry that atmosphere, right? And we, we yeah, we actually cause uh, more sense of strife. Uh, and uh, God wants something different for us. We are agents of, of supernatural peace, for one thing, and agents of his kingdom, yes? So he literally tells you, don't, 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 don't let anything make you crazy here. Go ahead. Uh, for evildoers shall be what? Cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. What? Does he mean that literally? Yeah, actually, yeah. He says, evildoers will be cut off. They're, the day will come when they'll just be gone. Uh, but you wait on the Lord, you will inherit the earth for yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. He's literally saying that the day will come when you, you look for the evil people, and they're like, where are they? They're all gone. Jesus came, and they're all gone. <laughs> right? And uh, go ahead. Verse 11 but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Where did we hear that before? The meek shall inherit the earth. Well, Jesus said that, right, in the Sermon on the Mount, right? And he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't making that up for the first time. He was quoting Psalm 37. This is what it already said in the scriptures from a thousand years before Jesus came. The meek will inherit the earth. And he just repeated that promise, right? And he, he means it literally. The meek means the humble. And he's, and he's talking about people that will trust in God. I humble myself and I look to God. I trust in God, right? I give my life to God. And, and so he says, you'll, you'll literally inherit the earth. Wow. He doesn't just say you'll go to heaven and float on a cloud, play a harp. He says you inherit the earth, right? God's kingdom, be, yeah, becomes yours forever. You reign with him forever. And you will delight yourself in the abundance of peace. There is a kingdom of peace 
coming. Oh, okay, that's pretty interesting so far. Uh, Psalm 2, verse 1 through 12, that's the whole psalm. And uh, this also uh, prophesied by King David, written by King David about a thousand years before Jesus, about 3,000 years before today. <laughs> Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We've got to stop on that one for a moment and, and uh, unpack that just a little bit. This is, this is uh, David prophesying about the Holy Spirit that the, there would be a time coming in the future in, throughout the earth, the kings of the earth would set themselves and take counsel together against God and against Christ. And that's what it is, against the Lord. That's, that's Jehovah God in the original language. And against his anointed is how you say, that's, that's Jesus, right? That means the, the Messiah, the anointed one, which uh, we use the word Christ today. That comes from Greek, but it literally means God's anointed one. When you say Jesus Christ, it's Jesus, the, the anointed one of God. And so there's a prophecy that the kings and rulers of the earth would someday work actively against God and against Christ, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. God's ways are oppression, but we're going to break off their cords so we can be free from that oppression. I don't know, does that sound familiar in any way? We're living in that day, right? We're absolutely living in that day. But what's God's reaction to this? Is God getting nervous and fretting? And No. Look, what is God's reaction? Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> he says, good luck with that. <laughs> really. <laughs> the Lord shall hold them in derision, and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Oh, that one we got to unpack a little bit too. This is God saying, I have already decided there's going to be a king on the earth, and I know who it is. It's Jesus. And the day will come. Jesus will be the king. And Jesus is God incarnate as a man, right? He's God as a trinity, and there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus is God incarnate, but he's, he will reign as a man. He will reign as a king. And when he says, I'm setting my king on my holy hill of Zion, it means that Jesus is going to literally reign over the earth from Jerusalem, a throne in Jerusalem. His kingdom will cover the earth, fill the earth, and that'll, that'll be it. And everything that resists him will be gone. <laughs> everything, yes, yeah, just gone. Ah, Okay, and uh, verse 7, he, I will declare the decree. Now, the, the speaker switches. This is actually Jesus speaking prophetically through uh, David, through the Holy Spirit and through David, if you want to really be technical about it. But this is Jesus speaking now in response to what the Father said, uh, that I will set my king on my holy hill of Zion, right? And Jesus says, I will declare the decree. The Lord, basically Father God, has said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. <laughs> what? This, right? this is a conversation between God the Father and God the Son prophesied a thousand years before he's born, where the Father says, I'm putting you on the earth as a king, and you're going to be the king over the, all, all the earth. And then and Jesus is saying, yes, you've also said to me, you're my son, ask of me, and I'll give you the nation. So when Jesus was on the earth in his time of prayer, right, 2,000 years ago, he read Psalm 2, and he prayed, and he said, Father, give me the nations of the earth as my inheritance, as my possession. And God the Father said, done, it's yours. <laughs> it's all yours, right? Go ahead. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. And stop there for a second, too. So when he says you'll break them with a rod of iron, so this is kind of a teaching or sermon that I, wouldn't, that I don't normally gravitate towards, uh, but I want you to see something that God has said that when, when Jesus comes, he will literally destroy everything that is evil and remove it from the earth. And, and the people that propagate it and cling to it and promote evil, he will literally break all of those structures. He will remove those people. Those will be gone from the earth. He will set up a kingdom, and it's a good kingdom. Amen? It's a good kingdom. But he said they'll, he'll dash him to pieces like a potter's vessel. That's actually meant to comfort God's people. If you're a, one of God's covenant people, it's God saying, no, the day will come, and I'll get rid of evil. You won't have to put up with it anymore. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's literally what he's saying. 
Uh, that's an act of love, by the way, because love doesn't permit evil to go on and on endlessly. Love will actually put an end to evil at some point, right? But there's a point for that to be done, and it's just not quite yet. But he says, now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Okay? God's going to talk to those kings who say, let's get rid of God's oppression. Let's throw off God's oppressive ways and the oppressive ways of, of Christ. Go ahead. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So he, tell, he tells them, right, the leaders of the earth, uh, he wants them to read Psalm 2 today and pay attention to this. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son, kiss Jesus. He means worship Jesus, give your heart to Jesus, have, a, have loyalty and affection for Jesus, or you perish in the way or you perish, ultimately, you're gone from the earth when his wrath is kindled. But, but here's, here's the, uh, the good news. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. You put your trust in Jesus. You put your trust in God. You're blessed. You inherit the earth. You reign with Jesus. There's a kingdom coming. He wins, and that's absolutely indisputable. Amen. It's good to know, huh? It really is. Okay. Uh, go ahead. What else? Uh, Daniel 2. There's a prophecy in uh, the book of Daniel that I want to I give you the, the short version of it, but it's also, it's the very same message, very encouraging that, that Jesus will have a kingdom on the earth, he will reign on the earth, and he will cover the earth, and it will be a good kingdom, and everything else will be gone. And that's good news. So this is, uh, the book of Daniel, Daniel was a young man in Israel who was brought uh, captive to, the, to Babylon, a uh, Babylonian invasion. And ended up living in Babylon, serving under King Nebuchadnezzar, who was an evil king who later had an encounter with God and became a believer. However, through Daniel. However, uh, Daniel is a, a prophetic guy, obviously wrote, a prophet of God, wrote the book of Daniel. And what happens is King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream uh, and it troubles him, and he wants to know what the dream means. And God actually gave him a prophetic dream about the future but he can't understand it until he gets Daniel's help. So it says, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. And then the king gave command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And I'm going to skip the, a bunch of verses and give you the synopsis. Is King Nebuchadnezzar says to all of his uh, what sorcerers and advisors and magicians, he says, you guys tell me the dream I had and then tell me what it means. Right? <laughs> and they go, we can't do that. You tell, oh, king, you tell us the dream you had and then we'll tell you what it means. And he goes, no, you'll cheat. You'll make something up. You tell me what, the dream, what dream I had and tell me what it means or I kill you. <laughs> and of course they could not and he starts executing them. <laughs> But then Daniel shows up. Daniel, God's man, Daniel. So jump down to, what is it, verse uh, 26? Yeah. All right. So Daniel shows up, and the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, astrologers, magicians, and soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came into your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. God is revealing something to you. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. It's like a statue of a man, right? And, uh, and now Daniel sees it clearly and he's going to describe it. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Okay, so there, yeah, he sees this big statue, right, 
of a, of a man, uh, maybe a king or a warrior or whatever it is, uh, head of gold, uh, then silver and bronze, and then iron and clay down at the bottom, four, four levels. And then you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, <laughs> which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then you have to know right away that this stone cut out without hands is Jesus. It represents Jesus. And the fact that it was cut out without hands is talking about this is God. This is someone from God, not someone from, from just man, right? Not from natural man. Uh, so this stone strikes this statue or image on its feet and crushes it, breaks it in pieces. Huh. Okay. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. <laughs> so yes, that stone is Jesus who destroys the kingdoms of this world and then becomes a great mountain. The stone grows and grows and fills the earth with his kingdom. All right. And... Uh, Daniel interprets this also. Now, he just described the dream right now, right? He just showed the, t told the king, this is what you dreamed, right? And the king goes, uh-huh. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So this is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Nebuchadnezzar did, as king of Babylon, he had like absolute authority over everybody, everything in his kingdom, and it was a big kingdom. There was no voting. There was no nothing. He's like, king, do what I say, period. Great power. Go ahead. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You, O king, are this head of gold. Right? The Babylonian empire, and specifically represented by the, by the king Nebuchadnezzar. Go ahead. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. That would be the silver part, right? The Babylon is the gold part with Nebuchadnezzar. The next silver part of the statue, God just, uh, Daniel just said, it's another kingdom inferior to yours, which historically was the Medo-Persian Empire, which immediately followed the Babylonian Empire. History verifies this very easily. Uh, and then uh, a third kingdom, uh, another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And that would be the kingdom of Greece, the Greek empire uh, started by uh, Alexander the Great, and which conquered massive territory on the earth, uh, and uh, very, also very historically easily verifiable that Daniel prophesied uh, this. God gave him the, the king the dream, but Daniel interpreted it and prophesied these four kingdoms, uh, three of them in advance that didn't exist yet. <laughs> Pretty cool. Okay. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. And the, the kingdom that came after the Greek uh, was the Roman Empire, which lasted like 500 years or something, didn't it? Or was it longer than that? Anyway, uh, my point is, and, and I'm not going to go into the details, and it talks about iron and clay and some details here, and, and I don't even want to spend a moment on that today. It's not my point today. But, uh, but it's, it's basically kind of some real prophetic revelation and detail about the, the uh, Roman Empire. But the fourth kingdom, iron, is the Roman Empire. Go ahead. And whereas you saw the, the feet and toes partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Keep going. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Again, I don't want to spend time on it now. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron did not, does not mix with clay. Go ahead. Here's where we're going. And in the days of these kings, the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. When was Jesus born? In the Roman Empire, right? In Israel, when they were under the Roman Empire. And this kingdom shall not be left to other people. There's no kingdom that, right, right, that replaces it ever. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So Jesus came into the earth, even when he was crucified, paying for our sins on the cross. They wrote over his head, the king of Israel, right? And uh, they're prophesying. But after he rose from the dead, 
His kingdom comes into the earth. It's still growing in the earth right now. And when he comes, physically, he will set up his kingdom on the earth that will fill the whole earth, and it will never be replaced. It will last forever and ever. Amen. Yes. Yes. And everything that is evil will be destroyed and removed from the earth. Amen. And he will reign from Jerusalem, as the prophecy said. It's good to know the future, isn't it? Yeah, that's great. Uh, who else can do that? Any other book in the world can, can produce, predict the future thousands of years in advance like that? Only God, right? Only God's book. It's the coolest thing. It's good to know that we're on the winning team, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 45. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold... The great God has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will come to pass after this. This dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. <laughs> I'm not guessing. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> so that's good to know. Uh, Revelation 11:15. This is uh, now the other end of the Bible. At the, at the end, at the return of Jesus, uh, it's, and the Bible says that when, the, when there, uh, there's a trumpet that blows, right? And then Jesus returns to the earth. And this is that trumpet. It says, it calls it the seventh angel here, but it's, it's that trumpet when Jesus returns. It says, the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, that announcement at the return of Jesus, every kingdom falls to him now. He takes over the world. Right? And reigns forever. And we actually, uh, that, the, the song that you sang, Doug, the fourth song there, right? Unto you, there's a line in that, uh, all the kingdoms of this world will surrender to you, God. Right? That's exactly where that line is taken from, is this Revelation uh, eleven fifteen. 15. I love that announcement. This is, again, something coming uh, in the future, not super far away, but in the future. And God tells us in advance. So uh, Matthew 16, 18, I want to read something that Jesus said while he was, uh, during, during his time on earth, during his ministry, he spoke to Peter, and uh, you, you, you know that uh, Peter's name was originally Simon, right? And Jesus changed his name to Peter and basically said, I'm, Simon, I'm turning you into a leader. You're going to be like a leader of my church, right? And, uh, and so he, and he does that with all of us, really. Simon becoming Peter was prophetic of all of us, God takes us from ordinary people and like a fisherman and turns them into a rock of leadership, right? And, and so Peter was that first leader of the church, really, of, of the other uh, apostles also. He was the recognized leader, and, and God goes on and, and builds his church with leaders. However, the real point that I want to make today from this verse is, Jesus said, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock of changed lives and leadership, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. And so Jesus was declaring for that uh, to his disciples that from this time, and as Jesus is here, it's, uh, beginning to set up his kingdom, from that time uh, until his return, there's really just one project going on, and it's Jesus building his church. And you got this, you got to put this in perspective because, you know, this is part of my message today too, is we can get very upset about stuff going on in the world, right? And, uh, and there's always some craziness going on. But remember what Psalm 37 said, don't let it make you crazy, <laughs> right? Don't get, all, don't get all crazy over it, right? Jesus is doing one thing. He's building his church. And everything else in the end won't really matter, Everything else, you know what I'm saying? And don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. Uh, you know, I, I, we're praying for Israel, right? And we know that God's with Israel. That's a covenant issue. Um, I'm praying for America. I know that God has great plans for America. Don't misunderstand me. Take action where action is due. But ultimately, ultimately, don't let it make you crazy because the only thing that's really going on that really matters is Jesus is building his church. He said everything else is details. And everything else is gone afterwards. He will have his kingdom. He will have his church. That's it. So, yeah, it's, it's really that, that kind of simple. So he, what he's also telling them when he says the gates of hell shall not prevail, he says we will win, but there will be conflict. 
There will be warfare. There will be uh, resistance. There will be opposition. Jesus was actually saying, from this time that I'm on the earth until the time I return, the earth will be in a state of spiritual warfare. I'm building my kingdom and my church, and the devil will be trying to stop it at every step, at every turn. There will be continual spiritual warfare on the earth for 2,000 years or until the Lord returns. Right? But he said, we're going to win. Going to win. I'm going to have my church. That's what it's all about. Everything else is details. Right? <laughs> Don't let it make you nuts. <laughs> oh, that's good, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, what that, what that also tells me is that really what, where my heart needs to be is it's a question of loyalty to Jesus. My, my heart's loyal to Jesus. I'm good, right? I know though there's other things that God calls us to do and be involved in our culture and in our world, and it's all good. That's all good. But my loyalty is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And in the end, that's what matters. And, that, and that's what God's doing when he says on this ark, I will build my church. Everybody gets to choose as much as they are given the opportunity to. That's our job. Uh, everybody gets to choose. I'm for him or I against him. And that's how it lands in the end. So loyalty to Jesus is my calling. Amen. Amen. Right? And helping to build that church to be part of that. Uh, now, let's go to John 14.1 uh, again, the, the verse we read for communion, and it might look like I'm going in a different direction, but I'm not really, because the title of the message was Real Peace in a Messed Up World, right? In a really messed up world. So one of the ways to have real peace in a messed up world is simply to know that we win in the end. How about that? Right? If that was a question for you, right? We're all going down. What's going on? What's going on now? Looks like God fell asleep somewhere. No, we, we totally win in the end, and that should give you a measure of peace. Just that alone. It does me. Uh, but then also there's another, uh, another aspect of this where Jesus gives us a supernatural peace. And it's, uh, well, let's, let's read first before I go there. So John 14, 1, again, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Just read that a little bit ago. This is his last time with his disciples before they go to the cross, or before he goes to the cross, I'm sorry, and uh, his last kind of teaching time with them. So they're just figuring out who he is. Some of them, they're not all the way there yet. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. He's declaring who he is. I am God incarnate, right? You look at me, you see God. Uh, wrap your head around that. Believe in me, trust in me from this moment on in that way. Uh, but he says, let not your heart be troubled. And, uh, you know, again, I've, I've heard, you know, some preachers say, if Jesus told you not to let your heart be troubled, that means you can do it. Just do it, right? And uh, I, I, I personally have a little trouble with that because I, when I got saved and was walking in my early years with, with God, uh, I didn't have total control over my mind. How about you? Didn't have total control over my emotions or my feelings of when I was troubled. I, did, I couldn't just turn that off and say, Jesus said so. I don't know about you. Uh, but, I, but I've learned that it's something that we grow into in our time with the Lord, right? And part of the solution is right here where he says, you believe in God? Believe in me now. Actively trust in me. Draw close to me. Spend time with me. As Jesus, as you feel his closeness and your heart is in just union with his heart, right? Letting your heart not be troubled then actually becomes uh, a very real thing because he is Jehovah Shalom, right? If he's God incarnate, which he is, uh, God is Jehovah Shalom, revealed in the, in the uh, Old Testament. That means God is our peace and our well-being and our prosperity and our victory. And the word means all of that, but mostly it means peace, right? And uh, he said, I am Jehovah Shalom right now. My presence is peace. My presence inside of you is supernatural peace. Whew. That's good, right? Yeah. Don't, and so if I'm, if I'm giving you supernatural peace, don't let your heart be troubled because now you're equipped with a real peace that has more power, right? It's not just you shut off your worry. You're equipped by Jesus supernaturally with a peace that is more real, more powerful, superior, right? And, but also let's read verse 27 because he repeats this but gives a little, a little more detail. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So a couple things going on here. Um, 
One, he's, he's giving you peace as an act of love and comfort because we come from a messed up world, don't we? And we come from a place where we don't, didn't have a lot of peace at all, right? And he wants us to have peace because he loves us because we become his people, right? Just that simple. If you see somebody that's all troubled and you care for that person, would you like to comfort them? Would you like, if their mind is all a mess, would you like to help them come to a place of peace if you love them? Of course, you just love them. You want comfort for them. Jesus simply, in one level, he simply wants comfort for you because we're coming from a place of brokenness and, uh, and a sin-infected world. Uh, and so he wants that for us. And when we, when we come to Christ, most of us are easily what's easily disturbed and messed up in, in our thinking and in our emotions and whatever. Most of us are very easily knocked off balance. And, you know, uh, and so he says, I want you to come to me and spend time with me and bring me the craziness right, that goes on in your head or your emotions or your fears or your worries or your anger or whatever it is, the disturbance. Bring it to me. Spend time with me and let my peace kind of permeate you, saturate you, right? replace that craziness with peace because I love you. But there's another level of this that I think is really, really important also, which is, remember Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That during the church age that we are in, he is building his church, there is spiritual warfare, and the devil is trying to stop the advancement of God's church and God's kingdom and the gospel. He's trying to, right? And uh, if, if you're involved in serving God in any, in any real significant way, you, you've probably experienced that resistance, that opposition, and some of that craziness, right? And so what Jesus is doing is he's, here, get this. This is my point. He's saying, I'm giving you peace. I'm equipping you for your role in this world when you're going to be surrounded by conflict and spiritual warfare, I'm equipping you with a supernatural peace that will be on the inside of you. Amen. Right? Yeah, and that's, that, that was, I'm sure, challenging them for them to wrap their mind around what he's talking about because we tend to think of peace, you know, naturally as peace is when everything's good around me. There's no conflicts, problems are solved, there's no craziness, nobody's mad, you know. And then I have peace. Peace is an outer thing outside of myself. And if it's, you know, there's peace, then I feel okay. Uh, but in this world, peace is always temporary, and peace is never even real. It's a substitute, usually. Uh, so Jesus said, no, you're going to be in a world full of conflict and craziness. That's just the way it is. You're going to be in a world of spiritual warfare, advancing the gospel. And I'm equipping you with a supernatural peace, the supernatural peace will be inside of you when the world outside of you is crazy <laughs> and high pressure and evil and whatever else is going on. This is an equipping for his disciples and his ambassadors, which is us, right? We are all at some level called to be his ambassadors and his disciples not just people with a ticket to heaven, right? But disciples and ambassadors. So supernatural peace that isn't destroyed, shredded by what's around us. In fact, Jesus modeled that for us. I think uh, last week I mentioned that story, you know, where Jesus was in the boat, with the disciples, and they're crossing the lake, right? Let's go to the other side. And then a big storm arose, right? which prophetically means when you're on your journey with Jesus and he's got a destination for you and you go, right? A storm tends to come against you, right? And that storm was actually demonically inspired to destroy them and, and to stop them from their destiny. So that storm rises up against them on the lake and Jesus is asleep and the disciples are freaking out and they said, Jesus, we're going to die. We're going to die. Wake up. You don't care, right? And Jesus got up probably rubbing his eyes. Like, huh. And then... He said to the storm, what did he say? What did he say? Peace, be still. And the storm had to obey because it was demonically inspired. It wasn't just some, you know, random weather thing. This was a demonically inspired thing. And Jesus is filled with the kingdom of God. He's filled with peace. He is Jehovah Shalom, peace. And this peace is not just 
you know, the piece of no conflict. This piece is a powerful piece with dominion. This piece is a force. It's a power. It's peace. It's supernatural. And Jesus is full of this, and he just rises up and he says, peace. Stop it. Boom. And then he goes back to sleep, I think. <laughs> Finishes his nap. <laughs> But this is what God's talking about. He wants, this is what Jesus is talking about right here. Peace I give you. I want this peace to be inside of you. This is what disciples do. And, and I'll make another point that really is important about this. If, if God is peace, when you learn as a disciple to be in peace and to stay in peace with him, you are in a connection of communication with him in the flow of his presence in that union with him. Because uh, that's agreement, Right? He's Jehovah Shalom. Your, your mind is in peace. Your heart is in peace. Even though the craziness around you, right? You're in peace. And that puts you in union. You're in the same vibe. Can I say it that way? With Jesus, right? And that's where authority flows through you. Power flows through you. God's presence flows through you. Communication flows to you and through you in that place. But, but picture the other way. When Jesus is peace, but you, you or I, we're all, you know, we're knocked off balance and we're crazy and we're agitated and we're upset and we're this and we're that and we're provoked and we're, you know, whatever else. Are we in the flow with Jesus? If he's Jehovah Shalom, supernatural peace in a broken world, we are not in, we're not vibing with Jesus. We're actually in a place of being knocked off balance and being all, you know, and so his presence, you're still saved. He still loves you, but his presence isn't flowing. His authority isn't flowing through you. His power isn't flowing. The communication isn't flowing when you're all knocked off balance. And so, does that make sense to you? Okay, so disciples learn to stay in peace. When we're new in the Lord, it's about, I, I, my, you know, I'm half crazy and I need peace just because, right, I just got saved and I just need some peace. And Jesus is like, I, I can help you with that, right? I know, <laughs> I, I love you and I want that for you. Spend time with me. But as you grow and become a disciple and a voice for God, it becomes more about as a disciple, as an ambassador of Christ, right? This peace is part of your equipping for your role in this world, this broken world. And it's something that you learn to maintain as a disciple and hold on to and guard it. And if you lose it at any point, you kind of regroup and go back to Jesus and get, get the peace again. You flow out of that place. Does that make sense? Right? And so if all that's true, and it is, then one of the things that the devil really wants to do is take away your peace. Because if he can shatter your peace, he can shatter your flow with God. He can shatter your effectiveness as a disciple of Christ, as an ambassador of Christ. If the devil can shatter your peace, he's playing you like a puppet. Manipulating you and reducing your effectiveness to... <laughs> whatever, almost nothing possibly, right? So that's why peace is so important. That's why Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be afraid. Stay in this peace because I got an assignment for you in a very broken world, in a very messed up world. Peace is part of your equipping. <sighs> yeah, and you flow from that place and you're more effective and more powerful and more influential. All right, crowd goes wild. That's good. So it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here. But uh, that's actually, like it, 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 when God was giving me this, it felt like he was giving me two different messages. Like we're talking about, you know, the kingdom coming and Jesus winning, and then we're talking about supernatural peace now. But it really is the same thing, that, that peace is both supernatural force inside of you from God now that we guard and grow in, right, uh, in our role during this time, but also there is the promise that Jesus will come back. He destroys everything that's evil, sets up his kingdom. We reign with him. We win. <laughs> we win. It'll be done. It'll be done. And know that and trust that. Amen. All right, that's good. That's good. Should we pray? Yeah. All right. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just a, a little bit of instrumental would be wonderful. We have something, and then, yeah, just take a moment, uh, if you close your eyes, if you're uh, visiting with us, I think a couple of you are, uh, we just take a, a minute or two at the end here, and just have a heart-to-heart -heart moment with God again. 
So. <laughs> so. Just come heart to heart with, with Jesus right now. And uh, we want to receive what he's spoken to us. That he is king, the promised king, and our loyalty is to him. And he is also our peace. So maybe just pray with me and uh, say, Jesus, you are my king. You have my loyalty. You have my focus. And your kingdom will fill the earth and I will reign with you. Everything else will be gone. But also, you have to say one more thing. Jesus, you are my peace. Jehovah Shalom. Come into my heart. I receive your peace. Powerful peace. Supernatural peace. In a broken world. Just receive. I'll just pray over you just another moment or two. Just receive and let that happen. Thank you, Father. You're pouring peace into everyone here. Jehovah Shalom. You're pouring peace into hearts and minds, equipping them with peace because you love them, but because you also have a role for them to play in a world that's right in the midst of spiritual warfare, right in the midst of spiritual conflict. So God, yes, equip, equip your people today here in the room watching online with a supernatural peace and help them to, to know, to learn how to flow in that peace, be centered in that peace and not let any, any other force cause disturbance of that peace. So they can walk in authority, walk in power, walk in your presence, walk in your wisdom, so they can respond in godly ways to things. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill your people this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.